Welcome to the March issue of the Journal of Vascular Surgery, Venous and Lymphatic Disorders. We have a number of exceptional papers in this issue, and I will highlight four of the great ones. The first paper, Impact of Provider Characteristics on Endovenous Ablation Procedures in Medicare Beneficiaries by Baber et al. from Cornell, determined factors associated with variation in a number of endovenous ablation procedures performed per year in each patient in Medicare beneficiaries from 2012 to 2014. There are approximately 405,000 procedures performed by approximately 6,600 physicians. The distribution of procedures per patient vary greatly in different cities and regions of the U.S., as you can see in this map of the United States. Factors associated with increased utilization, which are also shown, shown in this uh, visual abstract, were physician training in a field other than surgery with an odds ratio of 3.35, procedures performed in an office-based location with an odds ratio of 2.62, and a history of a high volume at the greater than 75th percentile with an odds ratio of 8.68. The authors concluded that providers with a history of high volume and those not traditionally associated with the management of chronic venous disease were more likely to perform more endovenous procedures per patient. And this were particularly occurring in the office-based setting. The second paper by Faravar is entitled Cryopreserved Placental Tissue for Chronic Venous Leg Ulcers. The authors compared standard wound therapy against human viable wound matrix used every one to two weeks in a prospective self-controlled study. 30 venous leg ulcers were treated initially with standard therapy and then with human wound matrix plus standard therapy. They found, as you can see in in this, this data, that the use of human wound matrix after a mean treatment of 11 weeks resulted in 53% of the patients having complete ulcer healing versus none who had it with wound care alone. And the mean reduction in wound size was 79% when human wound matrix was used versus 29% reduction when only standard care was used. The authors concluded that human cryopreserved placental tissue improves healing in venous ulcers that have previously been refractory to standard therapy. The next paper, Impact of Severe Stenosis in May Therner Syndrome on Recurrence of Symptoms after Iliac Vein Stenting by Jayaraj is a retrospective cohort of 202 patients who underwent iliofemoral stenting and were followed for 48 months. Stenosis was classified as severe, that is greater than 90%, moderate, that's 60 to 89%, and mild, which is less than 60%. At 48 months post restenting, those with severe stenosis had odds ratio of 1.3 of recurrent recurrence of their pain, swelling, and also worsening of their clinical severity score. Compare with those with moderate and mild restenosis. The authors concluded that patients with severe iliofemoral restenosis due to May Therner syndrome should anticipate some late recurrence of symptoms despite successful stenting. The final paper, over dilatation of iliac vein wall stents to treat instent restenosis or stent compression by Raju and Kali is a retrospective single institution study of 274 patients with instent restenosis or stent compression who were followed for a mean of 18 months post treatment. Isodilatation, that is, dilatation to the size of the stent, was performed in 24%, and overdilatation of 2 to 4 millimeters or 10 to 20% was performed in 76%. Those who had overdilatation had better clinical outcomes, a better residual iliac vein flow channel, 
and a better res residual stent diameter at 18 months. The authors concluded that overdilatation of wall stents by 2 to 4 millimeters or 10 to 20 percent in patients with restenosis or stent compression is associated with better long-term results. We hope you enjoy these four papers and the many other excellent papers in the March issue of the Journal of Vascular Surgery, Venous and Lymphatic Disorders, and thank you for your attention.